hosting class presented by City and County Broomfield in collaboration with Sustainable Broomfield. This class is going to cover the basics of compost and what we use to recycle uh, and compost our food scraps in order to grow more food. Simple and natural way to reduce our waste and also produce amazing soil amendment. This class is the third in a series of the green calendar classes presented by City and County Broomfield. If you want to view our other classes, please see broomfield.org forward slash environment. And our classes will go through middle of June this spring. Also on the website, you can view our other green calendar events that are going on that we are pro providing for residents. Next slide. My name is Dave Jackson. I'm your Environmental Services Coordinator for City and County Broomfield. Uh, I've been doing this job for about three years. I've been composting for about nine. So got a lot of experience, um, a lot of ups and downs doing compost at home. So hopefully I can help you guys out and get you started in the right direction and answer some questions at the end. Uh, if you can try to hold your questions till the end, your question will probably most likely be answered during the presentation. If it's not, we'll do our best to get to it. And joining me today is Brianna Holloman with Sustainable Brimfield. Brianna, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Brianna Hallinan, and I help run the uh, new nonprofit organization, Sustainable Broomfield. And we're all about composting. We've started our own um, composting club, um, which you can have the opportunity to join if you want to. Um, but we've done backyard composting classes as well. And we're, it's just it's a good way to fight climate change and we just want everyone to start doing it. So um, Dave, we already had a question that will this be recorded to refer back to later? Yes, it will. And okay. you will be able to find it on the broomfield.org forward slash environment page. If you go to uh, classes and events, there will be a section there that says previously recorded classes and click on the link for this cl class and it will be there hopefully shortly after uh, maybe tomorrow. And thanks, Brianna. Awesome intro. Okay, let's go to the next slide. All right, stick with me, guys. Let's just go through some basics here. Um, it gets a lot more exciting as we go on. So um, just the basics of what is soil. A lot of us know what soil is, but just if we look at it on a breakdown, it's about 45% minerals made of sand, silt, and clay. Uh, depending on where we live, 25% uh, water, 25% air, and 5% organic matter. And that 5% is what we're really going to be talking about today, is that decomposing material, uh, decaying plants, and other organisms. Next slide. So we love soils. They are the foundation to our world. Um, they provide the food we eat. Um, habitat for organisms, recycle organic matter back into our, uh, back into the ground, decomposing uh, clean water that we drink, uh, filters through the soils, uh, helps maintain clean air, and also uh, where we build our houses and homes and buildings. And so it's pretty vital to us. Next slide, please. So humus, is the organic matter that's in the soil of already decomposed matter. Humus is formed when the organic matter decomposes. If you go to the forest or your backyard, lift up a mat of leaves, you might find this layer of uh, dark spongy material that looks like soil and smells earthy. And this is humus, not hummus. <laughs> Next slide, please. So compost is the product of biological degradation of organic waste materials. It's the same as humus made by us through composting process. So by composting our organic waste, we can make more humus and do it in a faster environment than it would happen in nature. So we're kind of taking the same properties, the same ideas, and we're just speeding that up. Next slide.
So it's pretty basic stuff here for compost. It's not a difficult recipe. You really need food for decomposers to eat. You need the decomposers themselves, the microorganisms, bacteria, and the right amount of water and air. And we'll get into some more detail here in a minute on that. Next slide. So as part of the food portion of what we just talked about, the carbon source or the browns, as we would call them in your compost, comprise of leaves, eggshells, tea bags, coffee grounds, things like that, uh, produ producing that carbon that we're going to need to create the right mixture, as well as nitrogen sources or greens. So the things we're familiar with in our kitchen, uh, lettuce, spinach, um, zucchini, other kinds of veggies, things like that, uh, fruits, um, that's going to create our CN ratio, our carbon, carbon to nitro, nitrogen ratio. A lot of people go back and forth on this about ratios having more carbon than nitrogen. Um, in a perfect scenario, we want more of a five to one ratio of carbon to nitrogen, but any of us that have experienced composting at home knows that this is a really hard thing to follow. So um, we kind of just make it a non-exact science and have fun with it. Brianna? Yeah, my rule of thumb is basically when you throw um, a pile of compost of green stuff like from your kitchen in there, then you should basically just add kind of an equal amount of leaves. Um, for the green material, I've heard it recommended that you need more of a variety of stuff. But for the brown material, like you can use just leaves for that. Um, that's totally good. Um, but yeah, it's, it's tricky to get that perfect ratio. So I just do like kind of a 50, 50 eyeball, what it looks like in this green mix and what this pile of leaves looks like. And that usually does a pretty good job. So just a easy way to think about it. Yeah, that's a great point. And same for me. Um, typically leaves are a great source for me. Um, a, a lot of eggshells, tea bags with my kids, they drink a lot of tea and my wife drinks coffee. I don't. So we get a little bit of that in there, but leaves really is a, a big component of what we're doing here. So definitely save your leaves and you can add them in all year long, which is nice to have nearby. All right, let's go to the next one. All right. The next part is water. Water is essential to good compost. You really want to keep this moist. Moisture level 40 to 60% is ideal. It's hard to measure that. So we say, imagine a wrung out sponge or a dish rag. So something, if it's too wet, you know, if you squeeze it, water comes running down your arms. That's just, that's too wet. You want something that's got some moisture to it, but not too much. So, and watch what you're adding as far as veggies. Sometimes, you know, you get more water content in some fruits, some veggies than others. So that'll help with that process too. Also, if you're adding too much water, your microorganisms aren't getting enough air. So this is definitely a balance and you can look at your pile and kind of tell, you know, when you're needing to add and when you should back off. Next slide. So the next part, air, which is, we just touched on, these organisms need oxygen to process. So uh, these are the bugs, these are the microorganisms that we want in our pile are the ones that are using this aerobic process. If we start getting into those anaerobic processes, um, that's when things start to go a little south. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. So turning your pile is essential. Um, pitchfork, shovel, uh, tumblers, whatever, you know, whatever you can do to agitate this material and keep it moving around. Uh, this is a critical part of the process. Go for it, Brianna. Yeah, one thing that we've found with our compost club is that people often turn like the top of the pile. So if you have a big barrel or something, you really need to get down to the bottom and try and get some of the air into that area too, because that's the part that really gets compacted and kind of needs the air. Uh, to make it really working throughout the pile. So make sure you're really digging deep when you're trying to turn it to, if you want successful compost that kind of composts itself quickly. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, I do mine in large trash cans 
that have small holes drilled in them. And I'll show you some examples later, but with that, uh, sometimes they get so full, I'll bungee the lid closed, lean them on their side and kind of roll them on the ground and kind of get that bottom part to kind of agitate and throw its way upwards and kind of get that mixture going like she's referring to. So that's awesome. Good tip. Next slide. So here is a graph showing the ideal process of what's going on here. So as we add in mixture the first week or two, nothing's really going on. Um, it's gonna take a little bit of time. Raw materials, ambient temperature, you know, once those or organisms start to feed on the material, uh, they're gonna start to generate heat. So that's where we get into the middle of this graph where you can see the active composting is going on especially down in the middle of your compost pile is really where the action's going on. Hence why we're stirring so much. We're trying to get that material that's not being processed back into the middle and really help things you know, get, get going in there. So eventually it gets hot enough. The organ organisms can live in these high temperatures. Uh, the other ones kind of go dormant and die. And once the heat, uh, has, once the organisms that are in this high, high temperature stage, once they eat up all the food, uh, they start to go dormant, the heat goes down, and they've kind of used up all the energy that's in there. So if you keep adding food to your pile, this scale from two weeks to 10 weeks is going to keep going. So your, your piles, you know, the life cycle of your pile is going to last as long as you keep putting food into it. Yeah, Brianna? Um, they definitely can get hot. So uh, when I go out there and I'm turning the compost, like there's steam rising up in my face as I'm doing this. So, you know, that's a good sign that you're doing things right. If you're getting that, if you reach in there and it's cold and nothing seems to be happening and you've had stuff in there for a little bit, um, you might start looking at the ratio of things that you're putting in there. Cause you might have maybe too much leaves or, you know, too much green stuff, things like that. So it, it should get nice and warm if you're, if you're doing this properly. Perfect. Thank you. Let's go to the next slide. All right. Now that we've covered some basics, let's get ready to compost. Next slide, please. All right. Here's a short list of some of the obvious things that can go into your bin. These are the, the good to go list. So your browns, your carbons, your leaves, obviously twigs, woody parts of plants, nothing too big, uh, really small sticks. These things aren't something that I add into my pile uh, in, or into my containers on a regular basis. If they make it in there, so be it. Um, they just take a long time to break down. And like Brianna said, we're getting that good reaction. We're getting that heat, but sometimes you know, when it cools down in the winter time and you're not quite getting as much action when the sun's not out as much during the day, you might, you know, when you finish your product, you might have some of this wood material left in there. So just a heads up on that. Um, try to stick with your leaves and finer brown materials and your greens, again, your food scraps, fruits and veggies, garden plants, indoor plants, uh, weeds without seeds. And we'll go on to some more stuff. Next slide, please. So the do not put in your bin list um, can be quite lengthy. Um, disease plants, weeds with uh, seeds, like we just said, or runners, um, they could take root in there and cause some issues for sure. Uh, treated wood, definitely not uh, too many chemicals, things like that in there. Dairy products, meats, bones, cooking oils, fats, grease, all this stuff can go bad. No dog or cat poop. Compostable plastics, we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, I haven't seen much luck with breaking those down in a home compost bin. Vacuum cleaner bags and citrus and onions. I don't put them in my bin. I know people that do and have active enough systems to get that stuff to break down, but personally, um, I don't add that stuff. Yes, Brianna. Um, a couple things also like um, really hard seeds like peach pits, those they're not really going to decompose in there. They're going to just stay a peach pit. Um, <laughs> avocado uh, core or seeds are decent if you cut them into like the really tiny small chunks. But if you just throw a whole avocado seed in there, it's probably just going to stay a whole avocado seed. Um, Eggshells, even if you really want them to decompose, like crunch them up a little bit more because they actually take a while to, to really get working in there. Um, and yeah, anything that's kind of hard, 
when you start out, uh, you really got to cut it down to size. And one thing to really watch out for when you're adding all that produce is all the produce stickers that are on the shells of them um, and, and peels and stuff, orange peels or avocado peels, things like that. If you tear them into smaller chunks, they're actually going to go decompose a lot faster um, than if you just throw the entire like banana peel in there. So I always cut my stuff down to like one to two inches in size or smaller if it's a fairly uh, hard thing. Nice. Yeah, great point. Um, and Brianna just brings up a great fact that um, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why we're doing this together is to kind of show you how we all compost a little bit differently or a lot differently. Um, Brianna might do more effort in the kitchen than I would. I'm, I call myself a lazy composter. Um, that makes me kind of keep with it. Um, you know, I don't pay too much attention to it. I put whole avocado seeds in mine, but I don't necessarily want to harvest mine maybe as soon as she does. So I've had avocado pits like turn to dust because they've been in there so long, um, probably because I'm not paying attention to it and they're at the bottom and uh, I'm neglecting it or something. But one day they'll finally break down. But that's a that's a great point. Let's go on to the next slide. So this is kind of a starter, not exact here uh, with your bin. So you wanna start with maybe six inches of brown materials at the bottom. I started my bin back nine years ago with some old potting soil, probably from the season before that I had left over. Filled my bin with that. That kind of introduces or inoculates your bin with some of those microbes that are already living in that soil. And then just kind of start layering um, depending on how much you have, you know, like you might not have enough green material to build multiple layers like this. So just take your time, keep going, and hopefully, you know, after a while, you'll have this nice pile, add water, start to mix it up and just give it some time and let it start to happen. Yeah, Brianna. And I definitely do mine a little bit differently. So I add materials. Um, I'll like add some green stuff. And then at the same time, I'll add a pile of leaves to go with it. And I'll kind of just mix it all together at that point. And then the next time I go out, I'll again, add a little bit of green stuff and a little bit of brown stuff just kind of at the same time. Um, Cause if I'm just dumping like a small container from my kitchen um, on a, you know, every couple of days basis, um, I don't really get enough material to make a full like layer across my bin of green material. So I find that mixing the green and brown together right when I add it seems to work just as well too. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. And this, this slide was more meant like kind of a, a starter. So yeah, if you have that amount to work with, with greens and browns, definitely, you know, add like she's saying, but sometimes it's just like what we have available. So, um, you know, it's not an exact science, just work with what you got and um, you'll, you'll turn out some good product. Let's go on to the next one. All right, here's a good look at some different types of bins. There are all kinds of bins. You can go to Home Depot and go wild if you want. Um, up in the top left here, this is a tumbler style, uh, two compartment, maybe Brianna, if you wanna kind of explain, I know you've run some of these. Um, I'm cheap and I go with the easy route on the far right here, the trash can that's on the two pavers with the tea, uh, the uh, compost tea bucket below. Um, this is like a catch for any liquid that comes down through there. That stuff is like liquid gold if you actually get any. Um, I really don't get much at all, um, but this is a good example of what I use. Um, the one in the middle, top middle, is another version of a tumbler, just a single container. The one below that is a top load. And the one on the far left, the uh, center blocks, is called a three wall uh, pit. So these are good if you want to do more of like a yard waste type setup. Um, not advantageous for people that live by like fields and have curious dogs and animals that might want to come check out, you know, your snacks that you left out for them. Yes, Brianna? So what I use often is a um, more of a box shape one that sits like flat on the ground. It doesn't have a bottom on it. And so it's, it's sitting in contact with the surface, which allows those microbes to kind of work their way up through the soil into the compost. And it has like a latching lid on the top of it. Um, and it's kind of got like slats in the side to let air uh, go into it. But you do have to take more of a, like a pitchfork or something to turn it. Um, the tumbler bins are nice because you can just rotate them. 
um, but they aren't in contact with the surface. So sometimes getting those microbes in there, it, it doesn't happen as easily. Um, you might be able to add some worms in there, uh, some composting worms that could be helpful with those. Um, but yeah, you also want to make sure that your whatever bin or box you're using has good airflow so that you're still getting that oxygen into the system. Yeah, definitely. Good point. Yeah, the uh, the bin that I use, the trash can has, I think, quarter inch hole, uh, drill bit holes drilled through it and on the lid, um, just kind of randomly all over from top to bottom. I kind of do like a pattern and, you know, whatever, just kind of have fun with it and make sure to empty out your plastic shavings. I don't want that in my compost. So don't forget to dump that out or vacuum that out. But uh, like Brianna said, it's awesome to put it on the ground. Um, you know, having those worms come up, especially during warmer months uh, when they're more active and, you know, they still have access to it. So a uh, great tip there. I've never used one that sat on the ground. I've always used the trash can style. I'm up to three trash cans right now. Um, I just kind of see, seem to keep growing my setup. Um, so, you know, like we said, uh, different things work for different people. So this is awesome. Let's go to the next slide. So tips for success, uh, mix it every couple of weeks or each time you add new material. Um, I don't necessarily follow this rule, but this is a good rule of thumb. Um, a three by three by three pile or like a trash can or a bin size, size is a good um, you know, cubic foot area to keep that heat uh, retained on the inside, get good airflow. If your container's too big or too small, it might just be not quite doing exactly what you wanna do. Uh, next point here is do not add thick layers of any kind of one waste. And this happened to me for sure. I um, came home, my wife had added like probably an eight inch layer of broken down leaves that went through one of those Toro leaf blowers, but she put it on reverse where it sucked up the leaves and chopped them up real fine. And she poured it all in there. And I found it later and it just completely shut my system down. I had to like get in there, dig that whole layer out and uh, didn't have to start over, but it definitely shut down what we had going on. So yeah, watch, uh, watch your layers and, and don't choke off your system. Um, smaller pieces like Brianna was talking about are uh, really helpful. Next slide. So how do we know when it's done? Well, you've stopped adding materials. So you, that's when you wanna finish. Um, you don't wanna put any new materials into it cause it'll just kind of keep activating. So when it's done, you can tell it's kind of crumbly, dark colored, has that really good earthy smell. Um, this time frame here, three weeks to two months, if you're really active and turning and watching your balances, you can, you can turn out compost pretty fast. Um, the long period, two months or more, um, is kind of more what I look at personally. I'm looking at what I can use in May when I'm putting out my garden beds. So I'm kind of running things in stages, uh, filling up bins, then just letting them sit, adding a little bit to them and Sometimes I have to glean off the top layer to get to my good stuff. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of a trial and error thing with this part, like how much you're working at it, uh, how much you ignore it during the winter and you know, not a whole lot going on during the winter a lot of times. Next slide. Oh, sorry, Brianna, let's go back. Oh, that's okay. I was just saying it's kind of nice to have two locations to put your compost because you may fill one bin and then you're like, I'm still creating compost in my house and I still want to compost this, but now I have nowhere to put it. And you really want to let that one bin like finish composting and get fully developed. So it's nice to have like a second location or you could store them, you know, maybe in like five gallon buckets with lids in your garage or something. So I, I, the first year I did that, that's what I did over the winter is I just stored all my green scraps over the winter. And then I added a big batch of them in the spring. Um, and so that's called doing like a batch method where you add like a whole bunch of greens and a whole bunch of browns all at once. And you kind of like fill your bin completely and then you just let it sit and you go out and do a rotating and watering on a regular basis. And it gets itself done pretty fast because you're not constantly adding things to it. Um, your amount of compost is going to shrink a lot too. So if you have an entire trash can full of compost, when you start, um, you're going to have maybe a third or a fourth of your trash can filled with like that finished compost. It really does break down to a lot. So um, don't expect you're going to end up with an entire trash can full of compost because it's just doesn't work that way. <laughs> Good point. 
All right, let's go on to the next one. All right, like we talked about earlier, if you're having odor issues, um, something's going on with your pile. Um, you're getting into anaerobic decomposition. So we're starting to get that rotten egg smell. Uh, you got the wrong bugs in your bin. And so we need to change this by aerating and uh, drying out a little bit. You probably got a little bit too much water in there. Um, so definitely get your pitchfork, get in there. This is looks a lot like the bin that I have in my setup. This isn't mine exactly, but pretty close. Um, so yeah, this is uh, this is what I would use. So yeah, get in there, uh, stir it up real well, get the oxygen back, and you know give it some time. It's going to take a little bit of time to get that odor and get things turned back back around. Yes, Brianna. And a lot of people, when they're starting composting, I know they worry about, oh, this is going to smell. It's going to stink up my whole backyard or something. Like if you're adding the right kind of combo of like equal, like green and brown material, it really shouldn't smell it. You might notice an odor, like while you're turning it or when you open it to pour stuff in. But if you're standing like near the compost bin, it, like two feet away, you, you probably shouldn't be able to smell it. So if you are getting that foul smell, try something different. Look at the ratio of stuff you're adding. A lot of times it's like you have too much green material, too much nitrogen rich stuff that'll give you that nasty odor. Um, and if things aren't composting, you might have too much brown stuff. It might be too dry. So there's a lot of like different options. We actually have on our website kind of a troubleshooting page. So you can check that out if you want to and see like, oh, here's my issue. And then it gives you a little solution for what you might try to, to fix that. Good stuff. All right, let's go to the next one. Okay, so we talked about out in the yard. Let's talk about in the kitchen. So here's an example of a few containers, uh, countertop containers that you could use. The two on the left both contain filters on the top for odors. And I have never had an issue with this. Um, the one on the right is actually pretty similar to the one I'm using now. At home, it's a little bit larger than those other two, and it might be a little bit bigger than what you want to start with. I think I started with an old plastic Rubbermaid container that I probably lost the lid to, and it was just the right size, and it was just enough to make me want to take it out in the yard, you know, and force me to take it out. Basically, it it would get uh, full enough that I was like, oh yeah, I need to take it out. So that'll help eliminate odors. Is doing it on a regular basis. Um, but now we seem to produce more. And so, yeah, I kind of upped it to this bigger container and this seems to suit my needs. So yeah, it's really um, a preference, aesthetics, what you like, what you want to see on your counter. And also in this picture in the bottom, you can see there's some bio bags, which are those uh, compostable bags. And they actually come in these, uh, like a roll of them come with these sets. So I don't use them. You can try them, experiment with them, but personally, uh, not for me. Yeah, Brianna? Yeah, I don't really recommend using the bio bags either. Um, usually a backyard compost bin is just not going to get hot enough um, that it's really going to decompose those well. So I think you're still going to have like partial bio bags left over in your compost when it's kind of done. Um, if you were doing commercial composting, that would probably work well. But yeah, I would say backyard, try to avoid those um, compostable plastics. I actually have the, the middle type container and I really like it. I stick it like under my sink and it's, you know, easy to use, uh, easy to clean and stuff. Um, we have had members of our compost club also who just take like a Tupperware container and they'll put their scraps in it and they'll actually throw it in the freezer. And then you won't have to deal with any odors or anything if you're worried about that. And so it's, it's better for if you're collecting like small amounts, maybe over a longer period of time where it might start decomposing in your kitchen. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. And yeah, you don't have to use a countertop, definitely down underneath the sink out of sight. If you got the counter space and don't mind it out. I mean, they, they look pretty nice. I mean, the silver ones pretty, you know, good looking it. It's, it's not an eyesore like some of the other ones. So uh, whatever works for you. All right, let's go on to the next one. So here you can see a full bin kind of like Brianna was touching on earlier. You can see stickers on the banana peel and uncrushed eggshells. Um, I used to leave my eggshells looking like this and compost it for a while and would definitely see 
eggshells that still kind of looked like this when I would pour it out in my garden. So, and stickers, uh, Chiquita, you know, whoever stickers rolling around in there, um, not something I want in my garden. And also the twist ties, uh, like on celery, uh, cilantro, things like that you see a lot of. Sometimes the paper around them will break down a little bit, but then you got this wiry thing in there and it's just not, you know, not ideal. So recommend taking those off and empty your container regularly. And yeah, just kind of size it based on um, your production or like Brianna said, if you're not meeting that production and you need to freeze, uh, go that route. That's awesome. All right, next slide. So I, I think this is a important thing to mention is it's really just, it's more of an art, not a science. Um, with uncontrollable factors, with, you know, weather, rain, drought, you know, it, there's just so many things that we have to juggle here with compost. So it's really a trial and error system. It, it, it's going to work. Uh, just make it work for you. Um, however you want to do um, your compost, uh, just make it so you just want to keep going with it because it's, it's really fun and it's an awesome tool. Let's go on to the next one. So why bother with all this work? Um, really, we're, we're trying to reduce waste. Um, we're trying to produce a product we can use at home. Um, it, landfills contribute huge amounts of methane gas to our atmosphere. So greenhouse gas effect, um, you know, there, we can really make a difference here. Uh, landfills, uh, landfills are filling up like crazy. Um, they they top fill landfills every day with, you know, multiple layers or excuse me, like a single layer of dirt, but a multiple inches up to like a foot of dirt. So these, these landfills are just like landlocked capsules of this, you know, material that, you know, like isn't going anywhere. It's not breaking down like we really think it is. Let's go to the next slide again. Oh, I'm sorry, Brianna. Let's go back. That's okay. I was just going to say that um, when you put your compostable items, your organic items in the landfill, it ends up getting buried and then it's decomposing anaerobically. And that's what's really producing all that methane. And methane is like 64 times more potent of a greenhouse gas than CO2. Um, so you're really, it's almost like you're contributing to the problem by throwing that organic stuff in the landfill. Whereas if you compost it, you get that final finished compost and you put it in your garden and you're actually creating like healthy soils that are going to be more apt to grow things for you and then suck the carbon out of the environment. So it really is a, a big climate solution to start composting. Yeah, great point. This is a huge contributor to greenhouse gas. All right, let's go to the next one. So yeah, I see this in my neighborhood every Friday or Thursday night because uh, when I go home and I kind of shake my head and I'm like, why? Why do we do this every week? Um, last week before the storm, I looked at my trash can. I had one bag of trash in my trash can. I didn't even bother wheeling it out because I didn't want to pull it back through the snow, even though I didn't know the snow was going to hit you know, Sunday. So um, yeah, well, I think there's a lot we can do about this. Um, you know, combining this composting idea with educated shopping and uses of different types of recycling. And, you know, we can make this bin, this overflowing bin at every, you know, curbside, a thing of the past. Um, I think it's really starting to think outside the box and like, it's not just compost. It's, you know, looking at cities that are reducing single use plastics and, you know, uh, banning the use of like styrofoam boxes in restaurants. Like, you know, this is uh, it, kind of your, precursor to like taking that next step, I think, and start thinking like, okay, uh, I can bring my own to-go box to a restaurant, you know, like start thinking about those things a little bit differently. Um, and I think you'll start viewing things in, in a different way and hopefully it'll, you know, motivate you to start going down some of these, these other routes. All right, let's go to the next one. So here's a little cross section of a trash can and showing uh, roughly what's in our trash on a regular basis. And as you can see, that top layer is all that organic material, which is making up a huge component of the trash, followed by paper, construction materials, and plastic, metal, glass, miscellaneous, um, that kind of stuff. So let's go to the next slide. We'll look at some numbers. So this is some interesting data. This is actually Broomfield 
waste. This was an audit done in, I believe, 2019 of residential trash for single family residential. And basically a study was done where the auditor took trash from multiple different residences in Broomfield, took it back to a facility and actually had college students go through it and classify it into uh, all these uh, items on the left here. And as you can see, a little bit over halfway down, you see organics was 55% of Broomfield's trash. So 55% of that, it was all some type of compostable organic material. This is a little skewed because they probably most likely were counting commercially compostable items as well. So food waste, um, things that are not backyard compostable. So, uh, but it's still looking at this number, this number is drastic. I mean, this is a huge place where we can start to make a difference. And if you look on the right too, you can see our organics loading uh, tons per year was over 8,000 tons, which breaks down to over 17 million pounds. So this is just for our community here, um, some pretty strong numbers here to uh, hopefully get people on board with this. Yes, Brianna. I know that when I started composting, my trash went from like I don't know. I didn't, we didn't have a whole lot because there's only two of us living here, but I'm sure we cut it at least down to a fourth of what we had for trash um, just by starting to compost in our own backyard. So it, it definitely adds up. And, you know, we have like a single maybe King Supers bag a week now just from um, composting everything and really like trying to shop and buy things that don't have a lot of packaging as well and recycling whatever we can. So lots of ways you can cut down on all these waste things. Yeah. And if you actually add up all the stuff in this um, chart that's recyclable and compostable, it ended up being only like 10 to 12% of the stuff that actually does need to go to the, um, to the waste, uh, to the uh, landfills. <laughs> um, and yeah, some of this hazardous waste stuff can also be recycled. So it's that like little miscellaneous category that is is really like the only stuff that should be going to our landfill. Yeah, it's a great point. And it is amazing once this, you know, you start composting and you kind of see this snowball effect when you have that paradigm shift and you start kind of looking at things differently on the shelf and, you know, like, was this recycled? Like, what was this made of? You know, like you just kind of start looking at this stuff different. And then, you know, like Brianna and I are, I have a family of four, I have two daughters and we're putting out a single trash bag almost every week, unless there's something, you know, strange going on that, you know, we didn't foresee. So it, it can be done. I think we're both success stories of like how we really can reduce this. And, and that's why we're here today. All right. This is my personal failure and success story. Um, <laughs> uh, back to why bother. Um, I worked really hard in 2018. I started my entire garden from seed in February to plant my six giant garden beds. And my entire basement was like a vegetable grow facility. My wife was not pleased, but um, we grew all kinds of awesome tomato plants and pepper plants. I mean, we started everything, uh, heirlooms, all kinds of stuff. Then this ginormous hailstorm blew through Frederick, Colorado and absolutely shredded everything in my garden, including the lid of my compost bin, which the lid probably needed to be replaced anyway. It was showing some signs of dry rot or sun rot. So, but let's go to the next slide. So after all this effort and planting all these seeds, I was really bummed. Um, my house was trashed. I was more worried about my garden. Um, I went out there and saw this tomato plant that I've been growing and it was like four feet tall. That's like a six foot privacy fence behind it. This tomato plant was awesome. And it looked like a salad laying on the ground. Um, I was like, wow, can't believe this has happened. And so I kind of gave up on it. And sure enough, this same plant shot off another stock, ended up producing multiple tomatoes that year. And I always told myself it was because of compost that happened. So, um, that was kind of my success story and my belief to, you know, uh, why my garden came back that year. So just a, just a fun little story there for you. All right, let's go on to the next one. That kind of concludes our section on compost. I just really wanted to touch quickly on vermicompost. I know we had mentioned it in some of the postings that are out there in the city that we were gonna talk about vermicompost. 
And this is use of worms and worm castings as a soil amendment. Uh, this is a fun hobby if you get into composting and really enjoy it. I've done this for a few years now and it's fun. It's, it's very different. This is composting in inside your house for the most part. So worms are pretty sensitive to temperature. Some people leave them outside and, you know, they freeze going to the ground and you tend up losing a lot, but usually I'm running like 2000, 3000 worms um, in my bins. So uh, worm diets are pretty similar to what we're putting into our compost, uh, except everything needs to be broken down a little bit smaller. Um, I keep a small little Tupperware in my fridge that says worm food. So I cut up little bits and just kind of put it in my little bin and keep it in the fridge until they need to be fed again. So they are, um, they're a fun hobby and they produce some amazing soil amendment. Let's go to the next one. So here's kind of a busy slide showing a breakdown of a basic compost, or excuse me, a vermicompost bin. So basically to start this process, you need a Rubbermaid plastic bin, like the one you see here, um, holes drilled in the side, and we'll touch on that next. And basically you can add shredded newspaper and add your worms, add some food, some more shredded newspaper, and those worms are gonna start to produce those castings, eating those foods. And it's just gonna start this cycle of them producing this casting a uh, uh, soil. It's, it's just, it's amazing stuff. So I put this usually in house plants. I usually don't generate enough for gardens. Um, but this stuff really uh, does make a difference. So worms are a little temperature sensitive. Here it says 70 to 80 degrees. My house usually runs at like 67, 68. So maybe I don't quite get the production that some other people would with their worms. Um, but, you know, keep them happy, keep them moist. Again, uh, they really don't like when their moisture level drops. If you can squeeze it and feel that moisture kind of similar to your compost, they're really going to need that. Yes, Brianna? We've even had one of our compost club members who did backyard composting with a normal bin and he actually bought worms and just threw them in his regular bin. And he had success with them for a long time. I think in the winter, they would kind of burrow into the middle. And as long as the compost was somewhat warm, they would, they would make it through the winter. And he had to shut down his compost because he moved. And so he actually donated a bunch of worms to us. So we threw them in our compost bins as well. And it seems like they're still there. We might need to add a few more, but they do multiply over, especially over the summer and stuff. So um, you can just kind of add them as an amendment to your regular compost bin and it'll probably start decomposing a little bit faster. And, and they definitely like chew things down to much smaller um, pieces. So it's, it's kind of a nicer finished compost than a lot of your regular backyard stuff. Yeah, the, the worms are fascinating. Um, they're funny, they're kind of temperamental a little bit. Mine were temperamental, like I'd put strawberries in there next to like lettuce and they'd eat the lettuce and leave the strawberries alone. They were like picky sometimes. So I was like, oh, what do you want today? I mean, it's like trying to feed my cat. It's you know, I, 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 you got to learn them a little bit. And sometimes I put in, I think like, um, summer squash, like I had some summer squash that kind of went bad. So I had it like diced up into smaller pieces and I, I feed in piles and I'll explain that in just a second. But, uh, I picked up the dirt pile where my food was under and I looked and they had eaten the insides of the squash out and left these paper thin skins that you could see through, uh, that were just transparent. And I was like, why, why would they just eat that part and not the skin? Like, so you got to check on your worms and see what they're eating and see what they're not. You don't want to overfeed them and, you know, just kind of feed them like you would like, you know, your aquarium fish. It's like, if they eat it, you know, in a week, that's, that's good. You know, not, not necessarily like fish, but hopefully you know what I'm saying. Like you don't feed them too much, um, but just make sure they're happy and actually eating what you're putting in there. If you keep adding food and adding food and adding food, you're kind of, you know, uh, overloading the system. I've, I've read also that they don't seem to like citrus too much. So I think you're supposed to do really low citrus amounts when you have the worms. Um, I don't know if you've had experience with that. It's just stuff that I've read before. Yeah, I think that's why they probably didn't like the strawberries. I think they had a, they were a little too acidic for them. Um, so I just quit adding them. Um, I was like, who doesn't like strawberries? Come on. Um, so I tried it once. I didn't like it. So I was like, fine, I won't put those in there again. But uh, definitely eggshells, uh, broken down eggshells. They really need eggshells for their digestive systems. It really helps uh, with their process. And um, there's multiple systems. Let's go on to the next slide. 
So this is kind of a, a dual level system, uh, two bins basically. So this one on the left would be your bottom tray and the one on the right leaning up against the wall with all the holes in the bottom, that's gonna be your top tray. So you could stack these four or five high if you wanted to keep growing your system. Um, I think I've got a three or four layer system right now. Uh, mine's on stand, so like I can actually have like a little um, spout spigot at the bottom so I can drain off any uh, worm tea that I form, which doesn't happen a whole lot, but that stuff is good to save if you do get it. Your house plants will thank you. Um, so this is a good example here, the, the size holes that you wanna drill in the bottom of your top layer. Those holes can be bigger. You wanna have the worms be able to move freely through your bin. However, the ones on the outside edge, that bottom one, uh, you just gotta watch how big you drill your holes because worms crawl and they will get unhappy with your system. And if they're unhappy, they will crawl out and leave. And you really don't want that. And if your worms are leaving, that means you're doing something wrong, um, something either too wet, too dry, wrong food. Um, I've heard stories and um, yeah, I've, I've picked up my lid, seen worms on the lid and I'm like, hmm, okay, good thing I have a good locking lid on this thing because they will try to find their way out. Um, but yeah, and they're small too. So think small when you're drilling like earthworm and, and smaller. So, you know, like those newly born ones that are a little bit smaller when they finally get a little bit bigger, they, they're pretty narrow. So think small and, you know, try to keep them in there. And there's multiple different worm bins. You can have a single stage, um, kind of like the one in the last picture, and then you can build up from there if you want. And I don't have any pictures of it, but if you pick up your uh, substrate in there and start seeing little white balls, uh, you can look it up and see uh, on the internet kind of like what their eggs look like. You can tell if they're laying eggs in there and it's pretty fascinating to see. All right, I think that concludes. Let's go to the next slide. and. Um, that was pretty much it. Uh, Brianna, what did you have? Well, I was questioning, where did you guys, where did you get your worms from? Because it's not just, you're not just buying earthworms, you're buying the red, red. wiggler worms. Yeah, I bought red wigglers. I found an online site that did like a buy one, get one free spring special where you buy a thousand, get 500 or something like that. So I kind of just went for it. Like, I think I bought 2000 and got a thousand free. I was like, Hey, let's do this. You know, like I was getting ready. I think I probably just started this job and I was like, you know, let's go for it. I'm going to add this to the class. So um, I think this is the only the third time I've taught this class. Um, but yeah, the worms have been fun and online sources. I know locally you can get them sometimes. I haven't seen them recently. Oh, tools or uh, I'm not really sure where around town you can find them. Maybe Brianna can answer that better than me, but the online sources are good. They come packed in the dirt, like in kind of a mesh bag and um, they're shipped in a safe container with labels on them that says, you know, be careful, temperature, temperature sensitive animals in here. So they came um, alive and wiggling and they were looking good. Yes, Brianna. Uh, one thing that you can do is you can find someone who already has worms and then just ask if you could have like a, a bucket full of worms and, you know, add that because they are going to multiply. So uh, um, I know that one of our members had a, a bunch and was like giving them away because he's like, I've got too many in here now. I need to get rid of some or split them up or something. So um, if you find a, a friend that does worm composting, you might just ask them if you could have a little can full that you could take and start start with that. <laughs> Very cool. That's a good friend. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's pretty much concludes it. I'm sure there'll be some questions. We'll do our best to get to everybody. Um, this is our contact info. And like we said earlier, this will be posted so you can go back if you have questions, concerns, um, any anything for me or Brianna, you can see her compost club link here and her, her uh, email for Sustainable Broomfield. And yeah, just reach out to us and I'm here for you guys. So I've been kind of answering the couple of questions um, that have come up currently. Uh, so somebody asked, do the cardboard egg cartons count as browns? And I said, yes, um, that would be considered a brown. But a lot of things like cardboard, it's almost better to recycle them first because when you add them to compost, you're downcycling them and that you're giving them like the end of life. 
but cardboard is something that could actually be repurposed a few more times um, until it gets down to like tissue paper level. Um, so it's, it's almost better to recycle that. Um, and especially with cardboard egg cartons, um, the fish, the uh, Broomfield Food Bank fish uh, is always looking for egg carton donations because they get giant pallets of eggs and to sell them, they need specific cartons. So if you can actually donate your egg cartons to fish, they would, they would love that. So you can just drop that off anytime. Um, do you have any other thoughts on that? Dave? No, right, right on line with what you just said. That's awesome. Yeah, definitely. Instead of ending its life, then, you know, let's see if we can keep going with it. And uh, yeah, cardboard right now and, you know, fibers, that's, that's a good thing to be recycling back into the system. And I guess if you're struggling for browns, um, try to utilize, you know, if you don't have enough leaves, I've had that question before. What if I don't have any leaves? Somebody's probably got leaves near you. Um, and there's not really any rule on like types of leaves. I've heard like, I don't know if it was oak and maple that people didn't like as much, but I haven't had any issues with any specific types of leaves. So I think you're okay as long as they're dry and brown and crispy. That's what we're looking for. Yeah, you could also, um, you know, mow your grass and let it sit on your lawn and dry out and maybe then rake it up once it's kind of more of a dry material. If you add green grass, it's more of a green material. And then once it's dried up and brown, it's like released all of its nitrogen and then it's a carbon. So you could try that if it's the middle of summer and you're really desperate for stuff. Um, and then someone asked about um, how about tissues, hair, et cetera, should that go in my backyard compost? Um, some tissues is probably fine. Like things that are paper material that are basically down to tissue level, that's probably okay to add. So I usually add like paper towels, napkins. I kind of tear them up and stuff like that. And those seem to decompose fine. Some tissues though may have, um, chemicals in them from like the, the ones that have like lotion that try to make them soft. So it depends on what you're planning to do with your compost. If you're putting it in your vegetable garden, maybe you don't want that in your vegetable garden. So um, just things to consider is, you know, is this something that maybe has chemicals in it that I don't want? Um, hair is okay. I think it actually takes a while to break down from what I've experienced. Do you have any experience with that, Dave? Not at all, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if you want big hair clunk, uh, chunks in there, but um, I, I think that it takes a while. So you may be pouring out your compost and there's still like kind of a chunk of hair there that you're pouring into your garden. So um, you can, you can put it in there though. The other thing that I often do is things that I get that are compostable, but I don't want to put them in my, in my, uh, backyard bin is I'll just, I'll start collecting a small bag of stuff and I'll go to some place that like whole foods actually has like a little bin of composting stuff. You can toss things that are compostable in there. So I'll just dump my little bag of, of stuff in there. Um, or you can look into different curbside options, or maybe have a friend who lives in another area that has curbside composting, because all the curbside stuff's going to a, a giant facility and stuff gets piled up, it gets really hot, and it actually breaks down a lot of those things that, that just don't really work in your backyard bin. Um, and tissues, I end up just flushing those because um, if they go to the water treatment facility, all of that sludge that gets created um, through your sewage, they actually separate that out and spread it on a giant field and, and do composting with it as well. So if you, you know, just send it down the, the pipes, it'll actually eventually get composted and, and used in one way or another. Yeah, the biosolids. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty interesting, uh, uh, yeah, other subject, but yeah, good point. What else you got? So we have, how about adding some newspapers or paper towels without grease? I, I think that's fine. Um, even if it's a little bit greasy and you throw something in there, it, it's fine. Like just don't add a whole bunch of grease and grime and stuff in there. Um, the main thing with the grease is I think that it attracts pests. So you'll have animals maybe trying to get into your compost bin and, and bugging it a lot more than if you leave things like that out. But I think if you're just wiping up a little mess or something like that, it's probably fine to throw your paper towel or, or napkins in there. Um, Dave, any thoughts on that? 
No, I'm the same. I agree with you. Uh, personally, not something I put in mind. I figure if I'm using a paper towel to pick up something that's kind of like soiled surface, to me, I kind of deem that as trash. Um, if it's a cleaner, you know, like a uh, like if I, you know, I don't dry my hands on paper towels because I'd rather save that resource for something else like a mess of milk or something like that. So that's just kind of where I draw the line. I just, I don't add it. Awesome. And then Jessica asked, should I be concerned about excessive nitrogen when adding chicken waste? Uh, what do you think, Dave? I don't have any personal experience with it. I, I don't really it. either, but I would say as long as you're adding kind of an equal amount of brown stuff when you add the chicken waste, I, I think you're probably okay. So I just treat that like any other green material would be my suggestion. All right, and I think that that was all the questions we had right now. If I guess if anybody has any more and you wanna put them in our Q&A, um, we'll be around for five more minutes or so to answer those. Sure, yeah, we can hang out. And what was the website you were saying, Dave, again, that um, people can look, watch this video or click on the links and stuff? Sure, just uh, the Broomfield City page. If you find our environmental services page, uh, they're all linked there. Okay. And same for all of our classes uh, and events, um, the household hazardous waste event, uh, the electronic waste collection event, which, you know, that's a dual event. And then we have spring cleanup coming up and paper shredding event coming up as well. Um, so there's, there's a lot of information on there. Definitely some resources for the residents to take advantage of. And I might just talk for a second about our compost club. So we run this out of the Broomfield Crescent Grange, which is on the southwest corner of Broomfield. And uh, the Crescent Grange is just a historic building and it's got a community garden and they had a bunch of compost bins. Um, and so we asked if we could help utilize those bins a little bit more. And uh, we started recruiting people and we basically ask them to kind of follow a series of rules and do this little like test. So we know that they knew what they were composting. And then we gave them a bucket to take home and they basically fill their five gallon bucket. And when it's full, they bring it back to the Grange. Um, and we have instructions on the bins that just say like, take the pitchfork and dig a hole and dump your bucket in and add a pile of leaves and cover it back up and you're good to go. We even have, um, if, someone is unable to do the composting on their own. We have a few volunteers that'll pick up buckets from people and actually go and dump them for them. Um, and anyone in Broomfield that wants to can join. Again, just go to that sustainablebroomfield.com and we have a compost club link and you just fill out an interest form and we'll send you more info on that. Um, and we, we started it last summer and we got like 60 people to participate. So it's been a, a pretty big success. We actually had to build three more compost bins over this winter so that we can accommodate everyone this next year. So um, it's, been, it's been pretty successful and we're really excited to keep continuing with that until we can all have curbside composting, which hopefully will happen soon. <laughs> Good stuff. All right. Mary said, thanks for doing this. We just moved from Illinois. So I left my great compost and worms behind. We'll join the club for sure. Great. Good to hear. Thanks, Mary. Yeah. Mary, I'm glad to see you out there. I remember talking to you. I checked out your website. I love your product. And uh, yeah, good to have you here. Awesome. I think we only have like a minute left. Anything else you wanted to add, Dave? No, I think I'm good. I, if anybody's still out there, if they, you know, get started on their process and have any questions for me, feel free to reach out. You know, once you start delving into all this um, after this snow melt, feel free. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here for you guys. So let me know what I can do. Awesome. I got to head out. Thanks, Dave. You did a great job. And thanks you everyone for, for participating. We loved having you here. <laughs> Agreed. Thank you, Brianna. Really appreciate the help.